absolutely love engaging in conversations with coffee buyers and sellers about how to improve our coffee value chain. And when we have these conversations, we're often talking about productivity, price volatility, and coffee quality. And those topics are so immediately relevant to the quality of our supply chain. Rarely do I find myself discussing with coffee buyers and sellers the topic of gender dynamics in rural farming households and how that can be immediately relevant and immediately impactful to our coffee supply chains. Pinetto and I are here today to um, make the case that gender dynamics are very immediately relevant to our coffee supply chain because when you improve gender balance in the household, you improve your coffee supply. And when you're working on adding value to your supply chain, you can have the unique power to um, decrease the gender discrimination that exists within our value chain. So when Bacanzo Joint started in 1992, they were not considering gender and they were actually not considering coffee. They set out to start savings and credit clubs in rural villages in and around Chirumba. And after seven years of volunteer work, by 1999, they had successfully formally organized into savings and credit groups. At that time, and still without any consideration for gender and work and gender, they ended up with 98% of their members being women. And I want to ask Pinetto, why was that? Thank you very much. The reason why Bukonzo Joint started with over 98% women was that according to culture, it was men or the boys used it to go to school and the girls were left out. And immediately after school, this is when some of these men would move to urban centers, leaving the women at the household. And as we started Bukonzo Joint, we were only finding women at the household. And because they were there, we had to recruit them to become members. This is how we came up with the number of 98% women. However, though these men were used to go to urban centers to look for employment, life in urban centers was so difficult, but still they used it to come back because they own, they control all the assets at home, all the income at home, so they were selling the products, getting the money, taking it back to urban centers, leaving the women with little or minimal resources. So this uh, affected the household coffee to be poor because now women were saying, why do we work in the farm if the money is just taken by the, uh, the husbands within the urban centers? So this is how we came up with most of the women within the cooperative union. So just to reiterate that a little bit, what they wound up with was a situation, and there's tons of data to back this up, is they would have women who were year-round in a rural village, and then a man who would go to an urban city to look for work, and as we all know, cities are very, very expensive. So what ended up happening is they wouldn't find enough work to support them. They'd come back to the village. They would sell the coffee or rent the field out to a middle buyer who would pick the coffee. They would take that money and use it to support their life in the urban center. That left the women to sell some of the food crop or to rush to get a little bit of the coffee before the man could come home and get all of the coffee so that she could have some money to invest in these savings and credit clubs to support these families. So, I want to ask Pinetto now when and why they started considering gender in their supply chain. Well, all along we found out that though we are working with the women, but the income was not improving, the saving structure was not improving until 2007, when we sat down and started analyzing why is it that we are pushing things which are not moving. Then we are able to find a consultant from the UK. We sat together and we analyzed. This is when women came up with the drawings because they did not go to school. As you can see, this tree. So they presented women's side and men's side. And as you look at the men's side, all the resources that you are seeing, they are handling dollar fund, which means all the income that we are generating money goes to men's side. And some activities that are being performed by women are not having any income on, on the side. That is why there is no dollar thing. So we are looking at the roots. What are we contributing at the household? And most of it we are for the women. Then who owns what? And you find that the ownership of the resources that can generate income were owned and controlled by men. Then who's benefiting? So this is how the drawing came about, and we have several tools which are helping these people to analyze their situation using the drawings. 
So this is the gender balance tree, and it's a part of a methodology called GALS. GALS stands for Gender Action Learning System, and it came out of PALS, which was Participatory Action Learning System. It was developed jointly by Bacanzo Joint and Linda Mayu. There's tons of resource about this online, but they would start drawing these trees, and all of the roots were the inputs that people were getting. And when you have men and women drawing separately or drawing together what they're doing, it's hard to kind of hide behind those pictures. So you really start to get a visual image of yeah. what are people putting into the household. And then you really start to get a visual image of what Colleen was talking about when she was talking about ownership of assets and things like that. And then you start to also get a little bit of this sense of planning for the future because you're looking at what am I doing with the money that I make and what are we doing with that money together as a household. So how did this impact coffee quality? I think to answer that question, we need to talk about coffee quality in Uganda. And as you can look at our coffee, because there was that separation, men were coming selling, women were picking before the, the husband comes. So they were picking any type of coffee, as you can see the quality, and it has been damaging the quality of Ugandan coffee because there was a competition. When men could come and find that women have been picking, then they would get middle buyers, to rent the garden so that they take the money. And through that competition, women were picking and men were picking, the middle buyers were picking, so it was destroying our quality in Uganda. And this is why you find that Ugandan coffee is not being appreciated at a specialty market. When you look at this picture, you can see how people were traditionally and how people still do traditionally process Uganda coffee. This is Drugar. Colleen also had a picture of this up. But you can see there's a lot of green cherry in there. It's just cherry dried in the dirt and dried on the ground. Chickens are frequently walking all over it, which can't really be good for the quality. And you have this vicious cycle where this market for low quality coffee is really reinforcing a lack of communication and a competitive nature between men and women in households. And the competition in households is reinforcing this market for low quality coffee. So what did Bacanzo Joint do about that? And then from the analysis of the tree, the few men that we're having we requested them to visit other men and discuss with them. And through that one, you can see this is a vision journey, which is helping our household people to plan. This is a planning tool whereby they look at three years. You as a woman, how do you want to be? How do you want your household to be? As a man, as a woman. So everyone used it to draw her own vision journey. Later on, they come together. As you can see here, men and women wanted to, be, to work together and to improve their household, to improve their businesses, to improve their farm. And through that one, they were pushed to a higher level, which is a group level, and from the groups, they were targeting how many people are willing to do this activity. And after that one, from groups, so the visions were thrown to the union level, and now the union was planning how many members are we targeting for three years to reach to this level. See, this is how we have been moving up, and the number of men has started increasing to join up the union. This is a real success story of how this grassroots work at the household really um, came up through the cooperative up to the top to the, the cooperative union. And so when you sit down together and look really closely at these pictorial images that men and women are drawing together, you'll notice that instead of women doing 70% of the work in the initial part of the supply chain, you have these drawings where men and women are planting seeds together, they're working in the field together, they're picking red cherry together. And so in every one of these pictures, there is a woman and a man participating. And that has really enabled Bacanzo Joint to go from this situation where they were competing and trying to pick cherry sooner and sooner and sooner and getting a lot of unripe cherry to this picture, which was taken in 2013, and this picture, which was taken in 2014. And here, you can clearly see a man and a woman couple delivering their coffee to a washing station together. And as Pinetto was saying, this sort of mentality worked its way up into farmer groups. And because now there is this kind of transition, it was not only the farm level that will affect the quality, still in the process section. And because we've been now selling and getting some feedback from our buyers, so we are looking at how do we begin processing our coffee to reach through at least a specialty market. So farmers had to sit down and say, out of the money that we are getting, let us put some part aside to do some infrastructures which will be helping us to improve the quality of the coffee. So this is one example of the micro-washing sessions that farmers come together, work together, both men and women, to improve the quality of the coffee as we shall see how our quality has been moving up.
And then I just want to mention that even from here, the whole GALS methodology moved into the cooperative union, and they even do unique techniques where they'll put their entire balance sheet and income statement into the GALS pictorial images so that rural farmers can understand the position of the cooperative union. We say that the proof in the pudding is in the eating, and in this case, the proof in their work and gender is in the coffee cupping. And so this is a graph of their arrival scores since 2011 when they started exporting to the American market. And these are landed lots of coffee cupped by the same um, licensed Q grader buyer. So they're very consistent from year to year in, as far as their cupping calibration. You can see that they're on a really steep curve up and they are not stopping just here. And what's also impressive about this graph is that this is over increasing volume. So in 2011, they had two containers land and score below specialty grade. In 2014, they have 10 containers landed that have scored an average of 85.75. They're high. Yeah. <laughs> We all love that. Um, their highest type score, so before the coffee ships, their highest score has been a 90. So there is so much potential in this region for really high quality specialty coffee. Their highest arrival lot has been an 87.5. I think I mentioned that. And their lowest arrival last year was an 84. And so far this year, we're seeing 86 is an 87. So we're really happy about that. And um, what's so amazing about this group is that they go on the radio once a week. They have this specialty coffee radio hour where they're broadcasting to rural farmers and all of these little groups have started competing with each other and so they really look at their scores and they're all trying to you know get their own micro lot so there's Ihani is a washing station and that is being served by Salt Spring Coffee here yeah. today and they're so proud that they have their name on this coffee in the specialty market and so as these micro stations get singled out they, it creates a sense of pride and I think Mary mentioned in her presentation yesterday that it's not only about the value add and the money in your pocket, it's also about a sense of pride yeah. in your work. Yeah. And as we can see this, uh, these results, now it is coming up. Who is doing this? So it has shown us that at household, the moment a man and a woman come together, you can perform better than one side doing all the work alone. And as we shall see, we are evolving even the women in the training programs using their own pictorial system as we see the next uh, slide. On this slide, these, these are the type of people that we are having, although they were left out so that they could not go to school, we had to design our own systems of how we can develop our own training menu using those pictorial. So these are the peer trainers who move to different groups, who move to their households, explaining, like, as we get information from our buyers, we translate it in our local language, then these women translate them in the drawings, and these are the drawings that they carry, to take it to their own farmers and say, if we can do A, B, C, D, we are going to improve the quality and we shall get more income and the income will come to our villages. So the advantage for this one is that if you train more people within your community, then you will get enough coffee of the high quality and then you will get more income which is coming to your community. Um, and so one thing I want to point out about this picture is they do in include a lot of women in their technical training. And that is something Colleen talked about, and it's something that's so important when we consider gender and coffee and work and technical assistance. And as Lorena also pointed out, how can you ignore half of the population? And so a typical situation in global coffee trainings in rural villages is that men will take those positions in the training because they you know, kind of feel like they deserve those positions or they are the ones who are representing the household. So the woman is left out of that technical training. Meanwhile, the woman is doing 70% of the work on the farm. And so, you know, how are you gonna get that information transfer if you don't have the communication and you don't have the right people receiving the right information? So what's very unique about Bacanzo Joint is they're bringing the men into those steps in the supply chain, but they're also including women in the access to knowledge and access to resources. As you can see in this picture, the woman is included all the way up to the sale of the coffee. And so this group is working a lot with co-ownership of assets. Rather than having a woman own her own land, they'll say, let's put the man and the woman on the deed title to the land or the coffee yeah. trees. And there's a lot of land ownership and land rights issues all over East Africa. So you have to take those into careful consideration as you make these plans. Yeah. 
then we want to look at how this plays out in the cooperative. We are engaged in a five-year project with Bacanzo Joint that just started. We've been working with them since 2010, but it's funded by Comic Relief, and it's between Twin and seven East African coffee cooperatives, and we're looking at a lot of different indicators, and we had some great talks on performance indicators yesterday. And one thing we talk about with these groups is that performance indicators are not just for funders. They are for... Plus. Bacanzo Joint. And so these indicators have to be relevant to the success of this organization, and they have to be something that this organization wants to look at and measure. One thing that's very important to Bacanzo Joint is their leadership. And so you'll see that 40% are men and 60% are women. Yeah. And the reason why we are doing this is that uh, when men begin seeing some benefit at a higher level, they want to push away there some women so that they can own, so that they can control. But now we have a strategic, we have a plan, we have our, our, our issues that, okay, since the cooperative started with women, let us maintain at the higher level good number of women who will continue controlling this one, such that men can come at the bottom supporting at a lower level, at a production level, so that we can see how we can move forward. So it is our strategic plan. So they have 80% um, female membership right now, and they're also looking at more unique indicators such as disparity in income. That way they can see, you know, there's a certain percentage of women, but how are they as far as equality and in income? Men are still a little bit ahead, although the Conso Joint is one of the leaders in that kind of disparity indicator. One thing they're trying to do is maintain a high level of membership of women and then invite men into that membership, but they want to create a little bit of a, a greater percentage of women in those um, positions of leadership because it's so important culturally. It has just historically been difficult for women to be in those decision-making roles, and so it's important to nurture that at this stage in the game. They also have, amongst their staff, they always have a gender balance there. So they have two accountants. One is a man and one is a woman. They have two coffee cuppers. One is a man, one is a woman. They have two marketing officers, procurement officers. Their field staff, many of whom are volunteers, are also very balanced between men and women. So it's fantastic to see all of these indicators. So we just want to come back to the thought that balanced trees bear richer fruit. And this is very true for Bacanzo Joint, who has gone from seeing differentials well below New York to realizing differentials as high as New York plus 40 plus fair trade and organic premiums. A lot of that money is making its way back to these farming communities. And so they're very, very excited about both the work in gender and the work in coffee quality. And they see how that is a continuous virtuous circle that positively reinforces each other. Yeah, I would say for the positive notes, with all stakeholders in the coffee value chain, it is better now to encourage women participation, men participation in the structure. So we are so happy to see that you really invited us you, you picked our case as a Bukonzo joint, which is going to help so many people within the chain. Thank you very much. Thank you for this activity. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.